Okay, August 11th, 2022, heading south on US Highway 101 on the southwest side of the Bay Area. And I'm getting off at Shoreline Boulevard for the Computer History Museum. I want to say it used to be like the old Sun Microsystems building or one of those other companies like that that they uh, moved and this building was available so the Computer History Museum snagged it. Arriving here about 10:20. It's supposed to have opened at 10 o'clock. Arriving at 1401 North Shoreline Boulevard on the right. So the admission price is um, $17.50 and if you qualify for a discount being a student or a military or an educator or a senior citizen then you get it in for $13.50. If you're a kid under the age of 10 you can get in for $6. They have a nice lobby, little food court here. Get a snack, lunch, whatever.
computers on the head of those golf tees. And by the way, they do a um, COVID screening when you come in here. You are required to present proof of vaccination. Anyway, my camera can't focus in on this thing. Yep. the first 2,000 years of computing. You're not allowed to take flash photography in here and the lights are kept low. So, video is apparently allowed. So they recommend following this pattern and the layout pretty much leads you through it. So we have the uh, calculators section, then punched cards, then analog computers, birth of the computer, early computer companies, real-time computing, mainframes, memory and storage, software theater, supercomputers, mini computers, digital logic, artificial intelligence and robotics, computer graphics, music and art, uh, input and output, computer games, personal computers, mobile computing, networking, and the web. What's next? Then back out and then to the the uh, old mainframes section, which is down this way. So here we have some of the early mechanical calculators. The sector by Elias Allen in the mid 1600s and uh, another one by the Elliott brothers 1854 uh, Italy 1687 Thomas Heath 1760 Continental European sectors were more ornate than English sectors, and a wooden one. So the compass-like sector, developed in the late 1500s, can perform a tremendous range of approximate computations, from basic arithmetic to calculating areas and volumes or converting currencies. Logarithm book. And there's a uh, large scale slide rule here used for teaching how to use the slide rule. Made by Pickett in around eight, 1960. The Lord's Calculator by the Elliott Brothers, 1880. Desktop calculator had very long, easy to read scales. A slide rule tie clip. Eliza Wright Arithmeter. Arithmeter, Arithmeter, by Joseph Fowley, 1869. 
designed by the Father of Life Insurance to make accurate insurance calculations. There's a little bit on how to use the slide rule. And there's a example here. Let's just do a multiplication and division where we use the C and D scales. So uh, let's do the example they've got here, multiplying 1.6 times 4. So move the slide so that the left hand one on the C scale is over the small 6 that falls between the 1 and the 2 on the D scale. This location represents 1.6. 1 1.6. Find the 4, which is the multiplier, on the C scale. And it's 6.4, which is, of course, the answer. The Schickard calculator replica. The original was built around 1623. This is a reproduction from the year 2000. A desktop version of the Napier's bones. And here's a little pocket sized Napier's bones from England 1700. I have a video on using things like this on my channel. And a Pascal adder or Pascaline replica from 1981. The original would be much older, of course, 1640s. Here they have a thing on Napier's bones where you can play with them. Leibniz stepped reckoner calculator is in this picture. And the Tim or time is money calculator from 1910. Moving carriage four function design. And then the uh, infamous Kurta calculator from Liechtenstein, 1950s to 1960s. Hand-cranked Kurta was popular with sports car rallyists even after electronic calculators were available. The exquisite mechanism is still studied. section on the abacus over here with hands-on experiments. Cool. Uh, 
and they have a demonstration piece from the Babbage Difference Engine Number no. One, three-quarter scale replica, built in 1972. When I was here the last time, they had a full-size, full-functioning replica uh, or reproduction of the Babbage engine. It belongs to one of the early Microsoft founders, Mega Rich. It's a Russian abacus from the early 1900s. A Soroban type abacus with a built-in sharp calculator. Another Japanese Soroban from six, 1960. Fairly modern unit. This is a transitional Soroban from around 1900 and a Korean abacus from around 1900. A Chinese abacus and another one. Here's a, an erythrometer by Charles Thomas de Comar, France, 1850. And a erythmometer. That's what that one is. I should have said erythmometer instead of erythmometer. Um, National Calculating Machine Factory, USSR. A Burroughs adding and listing machine from about 1912. An Odner calculator from Sweden, 1920. Comptometer, Felt and Tarrant. 1890. Another comptometer, same company, 1890. And a Frieden SRQ-10 calculator from 1962. Their calculators were the first to directly compute square roots. I owned one very similar to this a long time ago. A millionaire from Switzerland. Marchant, 1932. <laughs> Anita electronic calculator by Bell Punch and Sumlock, UK 1961. Making a small, inexpensive calculator out of vacuum tubes was no easy task. It took four years to design. So it used vacuum tubes for the calculations and Nixie tubes for the display. An Olivetti Programma 101 from Italy, 1965. And then some very early electronic handheld calculators, the Bomar Brain. I have a couple of those. And an HP 35, I have one of those. An SR 50 from Texas Instruments, 
and a uh, HP 65. So some significance here, the Bomar Brain, which cost $245 in 1971, was pretty much the first uh, commercially available handheld electronic calculator. And that was a lot of money at the time. I'm fortunate enough to own a couple of those. And the uh, HP 35 electronic slide rule was produced in 1972, but uh, very expensive. I think it cost about $400 per each. And the uh, SR50 slide rule calculator from TI came out in 1974. It was their challenge to the HP 35 but it cost less than half as much, but performed pretty much all the same functions as the HP 35. And then the uh, HP 65 from 1974, it was the first programmable handheld calculator. This is the punched cards gallery. This is a Type 80 card sorter by IBM from around 1925. A Type 77 collator from IBM 1937. A Type 10 tabletop electric key punch from IBM 1940. A Type 31 alphabetical duplicating punch from IBM 1933. Type 11 electric key punch IBM 1923. International Time Recording Company, Time Clock, International Time Recording Company of, from the U.S. 1913, and a date and 26 pound scale made by IBM, 1925. A whole bunch of variations on the Think signs from IBM circa 1965, even in Braille.
the IBM songbook. Uniforms, rules of conduct, rally songs. Sounds like the old alma mater, doesn't it? But this story is about the early revolutionary culture of one of the most influential companies of the information age. This is a Type 82 card sorter from IBM 1949 and a Type 403 accounting machine, IBM 1953, and a Type 83 card sorter, IBM 1955, a Type 26 printing card punch, IBM 1949, And that's a uh, example of fabric from uh, Jacquard Loom, which was controlled by punch cards, using it much like a software program to, to do the weaving. A variety of different types of punch cards. And this is a uh, pantograph card punch from the Hollerith Tabulating Machine Company, which um, I think that's what usually eventually turned into IBM, if I remember correctly. And this is a Hollerith Electric Tabulating System replica made by Roberto Guatelli in the U.S. 1981, but the original artifact, of course, is much older. Let's go over and look at analog computers. So this is a Nordseek uh, differential analyzer, 1956. It says, how do you aim artillery, balancing, tab var balancing variables of speed, trajectory, friction, and other forces? How do you model a complex natural system like climate? factoring in constantly changing measurements from temperature and humidity to wind speed and direction. It's all done with differential equations. The electromechanical differential analyzer, such as this one, much like the mechanical analyzers that preceded them, solved such differential equations. Provided a powerful tool for engineering, rocketry, physics, economics, and other disciplines that needed to model complex real-world conditions. And this is a planimeter, or planometer, if you will. This is from 1883 Switzerland. These were often used for things like ship design. Measuring the surface area of a cross-section drawing of the hull gives the engineer information about what the ship's capacity and center of gravity would be determining its seaworthiness. There's tiny little tiny little gauges on there and as it says here we see history in the rearview mirror Earlier inventions often seem merely 
steps on the path to today's technology. Yet analog computers weren't just the ancestors of digital, they were powerful calculating instruments with unique strengths. This is a uh, Heath analog computer. I've lusted after one of these things for years, but when they turn up, they're either gutted or trashed, or they've been restored and they cost about the price of a, a car at least, or a lot more. But this is uh, the H1 educational computer from 1956. And this is a Telefunken RAT702 analog computer from 1959. And an EAI Pace TR48 analog computer by Electronic Associates, 1962. And an EAI 580 patch panel. Which is how you programmed the analog computers to do various things. And this is a trace computer by Packard Bell Raytheon, 1964. power supplies down on the bottom and then all these different computing elements that you could arrange in different ways and interconnect in different ways. And this is the uh, Medida, M-A-D-D-I-D-A, -D -D Magnetic Drum Digital Differential Analyzer made by Northrop Aircraft Corporation in 1949. This was developed for a nuclear missile design project used and it used digital electronics. Tracks on the magnetic drum did the mathematical integration. And there's some of the um, trace um, circuit boards. And this talks about some early op amps. Here's a EIA dual integrator network module. And there's a Fairchild um, UA709 operational amplifier from 1965. It was the successor to Bob Widlar's pioneering UA702 integrated circuit, which was the earliest monolithic IC op amp. This 709 was a huge success for Fairchild, which struggled to meet the demand. Competitors eventually made clones. And here's a National Semiconductor LM10 operational amplifier from 1978. It's another of Bob Widlar's brilliant designs and it functioned with very low voltages. It was in production for over three decades. And here's a vacuum tube hop amp from GAPR around 1955. This is um, an accumulator from the ENIAC, University of Pennsylvania, around 1945. This is on loan from the Smithsonian Institution. Lots and lots of vacuum tubes there, but I can't get rid of the glare that obscures a lot of it. And here's a portable function table from the ENIAC. We can a vacuum tube every day, or two. 
Entering the early computer companies gallery. Oh, we should go in here first. There's the back side of some of those ENIAC panels, but again, all I get is reflections. This is an Enigma machine, which is not a computer. Uh, it does not qualify as a computer, except in the sense that it is somewhat programmable. And there is a uh, tape pulley from the Colossus that was uh, done at uh, Bletchley Park late in World War II. The uh, actual Colossus is operating at the museum at Bletchley Park, England. And here's an ILLIAC electronics module, University of Illinois, from about 1952. The uh, ILLIAC was the Illinois Advanced Computer. Wait, this is it? Used 2800 vacuum tubes, weighed five tons, it was the earliest computer built by an American university. This is part of a Johnniac. It's the printer that came out of the Rand Corporation's uh, program. And there is a user console from the Johnniac. And there's the CPU with a maintenance console and a bit of a mention of John or Alan Turing the deuce arithmetic logic element from the English Electric Company 1955 the SWAC SWAC logic module from the Institute for Numerical Analysis, National Bureau of Standards, 1951. Not a lot of circuitry on that big brute. And um, the SWAC Williams Kilburn tube, National Bureau of Standards, 1951. It was used as a memory device. And this is the uh, Atenasoff Berry computer, a reconstruction thereof from Iowa State University from around. Um, well, the reconstruction was done around 1944 to 1997. But it's a working reconstruction. So again, this is not an antique, but it's um, made off the plans for the original. So we're back here in the early computer companies exhibit. Oh, I kind of skipped part of this. This is a Z1 binary gate replica from 1991, but the original was from 1936.
it's a mechanical device. A model K adder replica made in 1980 but based on the original version from 1936. Electromechanical. A couple of big batteries. A couple of light bulbs for output. A couple of uh, switches to be operated by the fingers, kind of like telegraph keys. And then a couple of uh, relays. They could do binary adding. And this is part of a Harvard Mark III resistor capacitor uh, system. It's a 64-bit magnetic shift register. And this is a Williams Kilburn tube. One of the two storage tubes forming the memory of the Manchester Mark I computer. Each tube stored 2,560 bits of information. These were the first form of electronic random access memory for computers. <laughs> so this is uh, parts of a Univac. This is a mercury memory tank. 1951 and uh, Univac vacuum tube chassis, three of them. No tubes installed in them at this point. And this is a Univac supervisory control printer from 1951. And a Univac supervisory control console, also from 1951. Here are some early computer circuit boards. This is part of the Leo computer. Display tube, paper tape reader controller. These are from the UK. And this is a Ferranti Mark I logic door by Ferranti of UK, 1953. And uh, part of a IBM 709 panel. A lot of stuff here on early, early IBM stuff. And there's a IBM type 706 Williams Kilburn tube electrostatic memory prototype from 1953. And an IBM 650 cathode follower pluggable unit from 1955. This is a control data Bendix G15 from 1956. All the uh, pluggable color coded modules. And this here is a uh, Libroscope or a Libroscope General Precision LGP-30, a U.S. device from 1956. This is a small drum-based computer for engineering and education. It only used 113 vacuum tubes and 1,450 diodes. It used conventional office power and required no air conditioning. Although it was difficult to program, it was the first computer that many organizations had. And there's various uh, programming tutors and study sheets and so on displayed here.
So this is the real-time computing exhibit. This is a uh, 3D model for the Sage installation. It was an IBM built model to visualize the place. Um, there were four floors, the telephone and test equipment floor, the computer floor, the command post, and the display floor. Really high ceilings in this place. This is a whirlwind rack from MIT, the Lincoln Laboratories, around 1951. And this is a Sage Weapons Director console with a light gun from 1959. This user console showed all activity in the airspace assigned to it. Operators could request information about displayed objects and use the light gun to assign identification numbers to displayed aircraft. And this is a Sage Intercept Technician console, also 1958. A Sage console filler knob, two of them with handwriting on them, 1958. So this one, somebody wrote, I can't stand it. And this one wrote, Don't you feel useless? Hundreds of people use Sage simultaneously interacting through groundbreaking graphical consoles. Ever on the alert for a Soviet attack, Sage operators describe the experience as endless hours of boredom, broken by seconds of sheer terror, of course. This is an IBM core memory array with a bunch of driver tubes and um, it's kind of hard to see but the core memory would be back in there. I've got a video on making my own little core memory. And this is a Ramo Wooldridge RW300 by Thompson Ramo Wooldridge Incorporated in 1959. It was designed as an industrial process control computer. Analog to digital conversion and input output buffers to monitor and control machinery were built in. This transistorized machine had a, drum, a magnetic drum main memory. And this is talking about some of the first computers to be built into automobiles such as things like anti-lock brakes and this is a Bosch analog brake system or ABS 2 controller by Robert Bosch of Germany 1978 and also uh, pacemakers And this is a Norden bomb site, the site head part of it anyway, from 1945. And a K3 automatic computing gun site made by National Cash Register 
in the 1940s, so that predated the Norden bomb site. So, sort of an analog computer, kind of. And this is a Minuteman missile guidance computer by North American Aviation, circa 1960. of electronics stuck into the skin of this thing. And there's the famous picture of Margaret Hamilton from 1969 who uh, led the team from MIT that did uh, the code for the Apollo onboard guidance computer. And this is um, a prototype logic module from the Apollo guidance computer. And of course there's the um, the interface which was called the disky. And this is a um, onboard computer block from the Soviet Space Agency's Mir spacecraft from the 1990s. So this gallery is about uh, mainframe computers mostly. data cells and magnetic strips and random access memory of different kinds. Here's a Johnniac Selectron tube by RCA. Thin film memory by RCA 1967. A photo digital storage system module. An early memory chip from 1973. <laughs> So we have a bit of an IBM System 360 here, the CPU module with a uh, interface. And an IBM 2311. A magnetic core plane from uh, IBM 360, model 65, 1965. A magnetic core stack from an IBM 360 Model 91 from 1967, an SLT module card from 1965, a standard modular system logic module from IBM 1959. 
Here's an SLT module card from First disk drive, the Bramac 350. When I was here the last time, one of the guys who worked on these originally was here, and he had this hooked up to a notebook computer with some software he wrote, and he was running this drive, reading and writing information to it. It was all functional. I don't get any indication they still do that, but maybe, maybe only on certain days. So this is the memory and storage gallery. We started with that RAMAC hard drive. Oh, excuse me. Zip disks, floppy disk drives, three and a half, five and a quarter. Eight inch floppy drive. Optical storage, there's a laser disk, a CD, a DVD. This is a data module from an IBM 3340 from 1973. A Winchester technology read-write drive. Um, various IBM hard disk drive units. Here's a RAMAC disk. One of 50 aluminum disks used in the RAMAC disk drive. This is a Victor 3900 calculator engineering prototype by General Microelectronics, 1965. An early uh, DRAM static RAM card from DEC, 1974. A 486DX motherboard from Taiwan. 1990. Silicon wafers. Silicon wafers, that is. A whirlwind magnetic core plane. A Sperry Rand Univac magnetic core plane. A 32K word magnetic core memory board from DEC 1978. And some delay lines. A Univac mercury delay line. A Maniac or Maniac Williams tube memory. Again, got that Williams tube. Williams Kilburn tube, like we saw earlier. An old phonograph recording cylinder from 1930, and a magnetic drum from 1955, and the Deuce memory drum from the English Electric Company, 1956. This 
is the copycats and competitors unit. This is a um, an Amdahl Fujitsu uh, air-cooled integrated circuits with finned cooling towers on each. Once again, that's uh, an Amdahl 470V-6 computer by Amdahl Corporation, 1975. And this is a uh, NEAC, not NEAC, 2230 or 2203 computer, console, CPU, and one tape drive from Nippon Electric Company or NEC. An IBM 7094 computer console, 1962. A um, Univac Unimatic console. Report processing system. and a scientific data systems 940 computer from 1966 a TI silent 700 terminal from Texas Instruments they have a little theater tucked away over here talking about uh, software Okay, we'll move into the supercomputers area after this. Here we have a Cray 1A from 1976. Power supplies and such are in the benches that surround the the main tower. A modern FPGA-based Cray-1 replica by Chris Fenton, 2010, one-tenth scale, fully functioning copy of the original system. Here's a Cray-1 Logic column cutaway. And what do we have here? An IBM Model 7030 Stretch Operator Console. An Atlas Logic Module by Ferranti and University of Manchester, 1962. A Cordwood Module from the U.S., 1964. Before integrated circuits, Cordwood Modules let engineers pack components into small spaces, increasing speed by keeping wires shorter. This is one of Seymour Cray's early innovations and all of his computers use this type of construction. And this is again a Cray console. A lot of cooling equipment down there. When it runs cool, it runs fast. And this is a Cray 2 CPU and cooling tower. 
There's the uh, CPU there. And this is uh, apparently the cooling tower. And a Cray 3 CPU section. The Cray 3 was supposed to be 10 times faster than the Cray 2, but Seymour Cray, unwilling to join the trend towards using many slower processors, switched to exotic gallium arsenide chips, packing more than a thousand in each four inch cubic or four cubic inch module. The risky path to speed backfired. Cray sold only one partially completed machine. Yeah, these days uh, we just use a lot of slower computers connected in parallel sharing the load. It's faster, cheaper, just better in pretty much every way than just making screaming fast, do it all in one place processors. And here's an ILLIAC 4 processing element from DARPA, University of Illinois, and Burrow, 1975. and some parallel processing equipment from Intel. A little hard to see some of this stuff in the dark. Can't get out that way. Okay, we continue into the mini computers gallery. The birth of the mini computer, maybe. The Control Data 160A from 1961. Laboratory Instrument Computer or Link from MIT 1962. The Blockbuster from DEC, the PDP-8. A PDP-8 IC logic module. A PDP-8 transistor diode, or a PDP-8 transistor diode logic module. 1965, that was from 1968 there. And then from 1963, a PDP-5 transistor diode logic module. So, I should have gone from left to right. And here's a uh, PDP-8 slash E brain surgery station. It served as a controller for a device that mapped the brain's response to stimuli. Previously, brain surgeons had to keep patients awake during surgery, but by wiring patients to a computer, doctors could stimulate nerves and analyze brain responses while patients slept. There's a Tektronix rack mount scope there and a bunch of other tech stuff and some other specialized equipment along with the PDP-8. And the DEC GT40 digital um, or from 1972, rather, and a Kranz Molby from Germany, 1970, and an IBM System 32 mini computer. This weird thing down here is a mirror, sort of a, there's a, another monitor down below that points up that you can read there, and then the teleprinter here. So again, a model 808 up there, Microdata Reality, Small Business System 1973, the Kranz Mulby we've already looked at, a HP product, the HP Way, and then a general data or general data Nova serial number one from 1969, and a digital PDP 11 
in this very sleek the kitchen computer by Neiman Marcus Honeywell 1969 is a model or a Honeywell model 316 mini computer hidden inside the kitchen computer the 316 was the successor to the 516 computer that powered the first node of the ARPANET which eventually became the internet so I guess this is kind of like a kitchen counter with a small computer console and maybe a display there I'm not sure IBM 1130 Scientific Data Systems 920 Wang computer my first job in my career we had a Wang computer that we only used for specific things otherwise we used a Commodore PET now we move into how digital computers compute section this is a little rudimentary here talks about boolean logic and what makes a computer circuit and then they promptly show something that isn't a computer circuit necessarily it's the guts of a particular logic IC and you can play around with this interactive thing and do some basic binary logic and they talk about going from vacuum tubes to wire re contact relays to flip-flops to integrated circuits to into to large-scale integrated circuits and this is a Simon 1 relay logic machine and there's a small display on how vacuum tube computers work with an example of the I or the MIT whirlwind computer from 1955 it's just one rack from it and it talks about some very rudimentary telephone um, equipment and circuits used at transistors and so on going up to experimental logic cards this is all about um, early ICs and transistors and then we get into um, some of the early microprocessors RAM, ROM modules, I.O. modules, CPUs this was a courtroom demonstration system it was designed for a 1995 legal case to demonstrate that the AL1 processor chip built in 1969 had some of the characteristics later claimed in several microprocessor patents and here's a 6800 microprocessor in a circuit from 1974 and a Bizicom calculator prototype that used the Intel 4004 microprocessor this is a better picture there we go and a Sol terminal computer by processor technology 1978 which used an 8080 processor and a Sinclair ZX Spectrum from 1982 used a Z80 speak and spell Commodore PET which used the 6800 and this is from 1977 this is just like the one that I had my first PET was just exactly like this and a Fairchild video game computer and then various improvements a wafer scribing machine various other improvements in the manufacturing process of large-scale integrated circuits I should be going from left to right 
So this is uh, the Artificial Intelligence and Robotics Lab. This is Shaky from the Stanford Research Institute, or SRI 1969. And uh, various toys and such that used microprocessors. The Furby from Tiber Electronics. The Andy Toy Robot from 1982. Big Track Programmable Toy Vehicle by Milton Bradley. So not all these are named here. The Hue Bot from 1981. The Century Denning, Denning Mobile Robotics 1985. The Officer Mac 21st Century Robotics 1985. General Robotic 1983. The Omnibot 2000 by Tomy, Japan, 1985. The Heath Kit Hero Jr. from 1984. Now these aren't actual robots here. These are like ro uh, the arms, the actuator arms from some industrial robots. Then we get into the computer graphics gallery. The Utah Teapot. Computers manipulate data, so how do you get them to generate images? By representing images as data. Martin Newell at the University of Utah used a teapot as a reference model in 1979 to create a data set of mathematical coordinates. From that, he generated a 3D wireframe defining the teapot shape, adding a surface skin. For 20 years, programmers used Newell's teapot as a starting point, exploring techniques of light, shade, and color to add depth and realism. So Martin Newell bought this teapot, which he used as the model for his studies at a uh, Utah department store, but it was actually uh, made in Germany. And here's a rendering or render man walking teapot from Pixar, yeah. This walking teapot toy was a giveaway promoting Pixar's render man software for movie animation and digital effects. It was inspired by the Utah teapot. This is an Alpha One computer system from Xerox Park in 1973 very revolutionary, used a early form of mouse, it had a graphical user interface, um, and was promptly copied by Apple, and uh, digital graphics. TI-99 slash 4 home computer a monitor. Various types of joysticks and uh, keyboards. The safe type ergonomic keyboard. Various other mice. Um, computer interface gloves and uh, 3D glasses. The Maltron left-handed keyboard, Arabic language keyboard, Chinese language keyboard, QWERTY keyboard, I should have been going from left to right. There's an Altair 8800 and a 
digital VT100 video terminal, a Telequote 3 terminal, Here's an early laser printer, the Laser Writer Plus from 1985. And a Hewlett Packard Laser Jet. Uh, I think this is their first model. Circular monitor display for the whirlwind. So this is just all sorts of different stuff. There's a Dvorak keyboard a light pen interface or light pen and interface a prototype Engelbart mouse replica a rolling ball mouse for the Alto computer a Sort of a trackball prototype picture thereof A beanbag chair. <laughs> the Park Computer Science Laboratory used them to furnish the room where they held uh, CSL or um, legendary dealer sessions, weekly meeting of the researchers. A bunch of people sitting around in beanbag chairs. And what do we have here? This is a silicon graphics uh, computer and uh, monitor keyboard. It's the 4D 50GT from 1988. Here's a Pixar image computer from 1986. Pixar was originally a computer company, not an animation company. It was a pet project of Steve Jobs after he was no longer with Apple before he came back to Apple. Um, a domain DN100 workstation from the Apollo computer, not Apollo space program, um, but a different Apollo. An AutoCAD, uh, typical AutoCAD um, interface and personal computer. It's not their product necessarily. It looks like it's a compact maybe. And a uh, Graphics plotter from Hewlett Packard. An Aeron paint systems from 1995. And then it talks about adding MIDI to electronic instruments. And then, of course, it shows a cover of the Switched On Bach album, which used electronic music, but not MIDI. The rest of this stuff is about MIDI. So it's an Apple MIDI interface, uh, MIDI drum interface by Mattel, a tiny little computer keyboard that would fit over a Commodore 64 to allow you to use it with um, computer music applications, and these piano style keys are just pushed down on the the uh, keys of the keyboard. The Muse was an algorithmic music generator producing a sequence of notes based on slider settings for volume, tempo, pitch, intervals, and themes. Digital Logic ICs produced the melodic bleeps. A Music Mate keyboard by Sequential Circuits. This was an add-on piano keyboard that uh, used the sound chip of the Commodore 64. And a MIDI uh, guitar interface. There's 
a whole section on computer games here. We've already walked through part of it. Caught the joystick part of it. Now we're into the computers, or the uh, personal computers gallery. There's an actual Apple One from 1976 here. And the Belleville Personal Computer from 1980. A little bit on the Homebrew Computer Club that was so influential. The Ohio Scientific Model 600 from 1978. A Cosmac Elf. The uh, Computer History Museum in Bletchley Park, England. Their uh, elf that they have on display is built by yours truly, but it looks just about like that because um, they're both faithfully following the original plans. This one has the video chip added to it. The one I built for the museum in England does not have the video chip. There's a Heathkit H8. One of these days I'll get around to finishing the restoration of mine. A Southwest Technical Products 6800 computer, which you had to use with a, a monitor of some kind. An EduKit computer, a Mark 8 1974 do-it-yourself, a Kim 1 computer. This was the uh, first Commodore computer, uh, even before the PET, designed by Chuck Peddle, who was one of the co-inventors of the 6802 or 6502 processor and also of the PET computer. The TV typewriter, which was described in a book by Don Lancaster. Uh, it was important in the development of early computers. Another Altair uh, 8800. An EPA Micro 68 from 1977, the Selby 8B 1975, the Micral, a French uh, computer from 1973, and the Kenback, a uh, significant early computer from 1971. I really wanted to build one of those for a while, but I finally gave up. Uh, vector graphic one plus plus computer from 1977 an MSI 8080 from 1975 TRS-80 personal computer from 1977 Commodore PET another one that's just like actually the one I showed before that said was exactly like mine this one's more exactly like mine uh, the model of cassette deck that's in it is more like the one I had. And the blue bezel around the screen is what mine had. The previous one we looked at had a uh, black bezel and the slightly later model of the cassette deck. So this one's uh, closer. But mine did not have color on the uh, label here where this one does. And then an Apple II from 1977. These all came out. This is the uh, the trinity of personal computers as they often are called. The three that all came out essentially at the same time. They all have uh, arguments for why they should be considered to be the first of the three. Um, the, the first one you could actually get your hands on was supposedly the PET. Um, like Radio Shack advertised theirs first but you couldn't actually get your hands on them as quickly. Apple came out slightly later. I forget exactly what the distinctions are, but they all have claims to being the first. And then there's various uh, Ataris and Luxor from Sweden and Kookaburra portable computer from Australia, ZX80, Sinclair ZX Spectrum, the Hit Bit home computer from Sony Japan, 
the CPC 464 from Amstrad UK, the Dragon 32 from the UK, the BBC microcomputer system from Acorn Computers, 1981, Sinclair QL microcomputer from 1984, 1040ST computer system by Atari, 1988, a Thompson T07-70 from France, 1984, an Amiga 1000 by Commodore, 1985, Commodore 64 from 1982, Commodore VIC-20 from 1980, and a uh, Compact Desk Pro 286 from 1987, Columbia PC 1982, Compact Portable 1982, Franklin Ace 100 1982, IBM PC compatible portable prototype by Lee Felsenstein 1982 personal system slash 2 or PS2 from IBM 1987 the master master personal computer from Russia 1993 the Olympian S computer from Russia, 1995. It's probably worth saying something about these. This computer for education and games was an illegal clone of the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. And uh, the this one is also a clone of the ZX Spectrum. The Robotron Z9100 from East Germany 1984. It was a clone of the Zilog, or it used the U880 microprocessor, which was a clone of the Z80. The Eagle PC from 1982. The outbound systems in 1991. Hyperion computer systems from Canada 1982. There's more of the computer game stuff. And of course we have uh, an IBM PC back here and uh, another Apple II. And there's some more of the Apple stuff with a Macintosh and a Lisa and a uh, Turbo PC, one of the many clones. Then there's a section on mobile computing. So you've got things like the Palm Pilot here. I had a Palm Pilot and I loved the thing. In many ways it was much better than my smartphone for doing a lot of stuff. Um, a little keyboard based Palm Pilot. Palm Pilot prototype, 1995. This is a Scout all-terrain sub-notebook by Millard Technologies, 1999. The rugged Scout featured a water-resistant magnesium construction rubber bumpers to absorb shock, a floating hard drive suspension, and communication with the home office over the Ardis Digital Data Network. And we've got stuff like the IXO telecomputer from 1982. A model of the U.S. Army Moby Dick. <laughs> Moby Dick, <laughs> I guess you're supposed to say. Digital computer by Sylvania, 1959. A model of Dynabook, Dynamic Notebook by, uh, it's a replica very rough one. A Sony type quarter 1980. 
a Scrib Portable from Switzerland, 1978. The Xerox Note Taker by Xerox Park, 1976. A very prototypical looking thing, not very finished. Had a storage place for the mouse. The MCM70 Microcomputer from Canada, 1973. And the Kyocera Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 100. I've uh, got one of these at home. One of these days I'll take it out and make a video about it. The uh, Osborne One. Oops. Need to zoom out. The Osborne One from 1981. The Apple Duo laptop with dock, 1992. The PowerBook 140 by Apple, 1991. The ThinkPad 701 with butterfly keyboard from IBM, 1995. The Grid Compass laptop, 1982. The sleek, pricey compass was the most successful early clamshell style notebook or laptop computer. The Gavilan mobile computer, 1983. The uh, Poké PC sub notebook, 1989. Then we get into things like the QC1 calculator by Casio. It was a calculator on its way to becoming a handheld organizer. It had a clock, alarm, and scheduler features. The LC836 Memo Note 30 by Toshiba, 1978. The PF8000 handheld computer by Casio, 1980. The Scion organizer from the UK, 1984. Nixdorf, Betty Crocker, Cookbook by Franklin Electronics, an iPod prototype over there. The UPS Dyad Delivery Information Acquisition Device from 1993, used by the United Parcel Service. Fujitsu, running Windows for Pen Computing, Japan, 1993. The Poseidon Workabout Prototype. Uh, Franklin Rocket eBook, EO Personal Communicator, the Grid Pad Tablet Computer, the Newton Message Pad. Oh, excuse me. Scion Series Three Organizer from the UK, and just a whole plethora of other people's efforts to make personal organizers, some more successful than others. The Palm Pilot from 1996, Compact IPAC and so on, Sony Palm Top. Over here we've got a somewhat computerized bicycle. <laughs> There's a Datamax scuba or sport scuba diving computer from 1994. A wrist top computer watch from Finland or 2004. A TomTom -tom GPS car navigation system from 2005. This is the behemoth. Big electronic human energized machine only too heavy. <laughs> Uh, by Steve Roberts, 1989. Behemoth was the last and heaviest of three bicycles built by brilliant self-taught engineer Steve Roberts. Behemoth weighs 580 pounds loaded, integrating three laptops and several wireless communication systems. Handlebar keys and helmet mounted display enable typing while riding. So it's basically a, uh, a long recumbent bicycle with uh, lots of electronics added to it. This is the uh, networking and the web display 
This is just a kind of a history of early Morse code telegraphy and various enhancements <laughs> that were added onto it, going to teletypes and modems. Here's a USB modem. This is an ARPANET interface message processor from 1969, beginnings of the internet. And various examples of home type uh, net equipment. A um, systems network architecture controller from 1994. The web plus internet equals success. This is one of the next computers. And uh, various other terminals and so on that could be used with the net. And I think this is the e-commerce and what's next gallery. All sorts of things, playing interactive games, doing e-commerce. And that's the end of the main museum display. We'll get back to the lobby here. We're back to where we started by the abacuses and things like that. Now we can go over to the annex for some of the uh, operating mainframes. Here's the DEC PDP-1 demo lab. Considering how few PDP-1s were sold, perhaps 50 of them made, the number of people who saw Space War was high because so many of them went to universities. In 1972, if they're doing a demo there, you can play the early version of Space War on that. Then we have the IBM 1401 demo lab. This was running the last time I was here. I think they may have scheduled demonstrations when the volunteers are available to do it and when the equipment is working, which may not always be the case. Got the whole 1401 um, system here. So the basic computer is here and then you've got a card reader puncher and uh, the tape storage back there and a couple line printers which literally print one whole line of text at a time just boom and a line is printed it's not printed character by character this is screamingly fast you know it could just throw big sheets of densely printed paper out at an alarming rate quite interesting technology considering when it was made They, uh, when I was here before, you were able to go somewhere in here and key in your name and get a card punched, and then the punched card for a bunch of people, whoever was in the tour, would be fed into the machine through a card reader, and then the computer would process the letters 
and use these printers to print out uh, a one-page certificate <laughs> with your name printed in huge letters, com each letter comprised of lots of small letters. And this is a processing unit, uh, more tape drives, more card readers. My understanding is it's almost a constant process to keep this stuff working. Um, modules fail left and right and when they've got it working and have volunteers handy to demonstrate it, this is a working computer here. So either here I'm here on the wrong day or the wrong time of day or something. So that's down that way. There's a little gallery on here. Looks like it has to do primarily with gaming software. When I was here last, that area where I was just standing was occupied by the Babbage difference engine. There's a little bit about the uh, MRIs and car crash simulations. This is kind of a learning center over here, but uh, that's pretty much the end of the museum. Okay, well it took me two and a half hours to just do a quick walk through. Since I've been here before, I wasn't stopping to study everything. I was mostly just doing the walk through for the video. But uh, I think that if you allowed two hours and just breezed through quickly, you could do it. But if you really want to stop and read and learn, you better allow at least three hours 